Good morning. Um, we'll look at the passage Gareth read for us a moment ago, Deuteronomy 7 together. But before we do that, um, let me read out from the well-known passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Uh, even difficult passages like Deuteronomy chapter 7. So let me pray and we'll look at Heavenly Father, we do confess and believe that every single word given to you is good for us. So please teach us from Deuteronomy chapter 7 this morning what we do not know. Uh, give us what we do not have and make us what we are not for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There is nothing sentimental about the Bible's message. Uh, only by taking random texts out of their proper context, uh, you can make the Bible into a collection of sweet thoughts, like God loves you. The Bible speaks about the gospel and Jesus Christ's coming kingdom, and that is a very serious message. We often speak of the gospel as good news. I don't know whether you've done that. I've done that in the past. But, but you know, if we are completely trying to be accurate, that only captures one side of the story, doesn't it? The word gospel coming from the Greek word euangelion means momentous news. News of great significance that you cannot ignore. You ought to respond. Uh, that's what you had to do with the gospel of Caesar when it was proclaimed in the Roman world that Caesar is the Lord. Whether that becomes good or grievous to you depended on your personal response to that news. Now, Christian gospel declares that Jesus is the Christ, God's anointed one. He is the king of God's coming kingdom, a kingdom of righteousness, joy, and peace. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verse 7, in his kingdom there will be no more death, mourning, or crying, only everlasting life with God, Revelation chapter 21. The news of this kingdom is indeed good news, the best news for the world under the shadow of death. Uh, but this news comes with the necessary corollary. That is, all the other kingdoms of the earth will be destroyed. That's how Revelation 21 ends, doesn't it? The, the book of Revelation, glorious vision of the new creation coming, the kingdom of God in fullness. But it comes with that awful judgment sin throughout the book of Revelation. All who do not bow their knees to Christ will face God's wrath and eternal punishment. This is a serious message. Some, say, some would say disturbing. The good news comes with grievous warning. And this nature of the gospel is already foreshadowed in the book of Deuteronomy, the gospel according to Moses. God is faithful and good to his people. He leads them into the promised land to live under God's presence, under God's blessing. But for those who hate God and God's people, there will be judgment. There will be complete destruction of evil and evildoers. Now listen to the words of Moses again from uh, uh, chapter 7 verse 1. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you. And you'll see where these nations are in the slides behind me. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites on the eastern border of the promised land, the Canaanites along the coast, what's known as Phoenicia, the Perizzites and the Hivites, the, the uh, uh, desert dwellers, and the Jebusites uh, lived near Jerusalem. Seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them. Show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will quickly kindled against you and you'd be destroyed. 
But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars, chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. They're very confronting words, aren't they? Uh, in case we're tempted to reply, did God actually say that? You heard that somewhere in the Bible. Moses repeats the command again in verse 16, halfway through the speech. You shall consume all the peoples that the Lord your God will give over to you. Your eye shall not pity them, neither shall you serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. Then again, as he concludes in verses 24 to 26, he will give their kings into your hand and you shall make their name perish under heaven. Now, a few other passages of the Bible makes modern people feel as uncomfortable and disturbed as Deuteronomy chapter 7. Uh, perhaps the Bible's prohibition of homosexual sexual practices may be one, another one, uh, as well as the Bible's endorsement of the male headship in marriage. I wonder whether you already feel uncomfortable as I speak about these things. But for many believers, this may be the most difficult. God... Uh, God, whom we believe as God of love, explicitly commanding violence and murder of people groups. So the Bible is not a feel-good, self-help book, is it? You, you can only make Bible to be like that by just taking text out of context. Now, do you feel the difficulty as we read Deuteronomy chapter 7? Uh, I mean, I found it very uneasy as I was preparing for this passage throughout the week. But I believe that's one of the intentions of this passage. That all scripture being breathed out by God, profitable for our teaching. And one of the reasons why Deuteronomy 7 is given us, when you feel uncomfortable reading the Bible, be patient. Because I think the Bible is probably trying to teach us something very important. Now, some people try to relieve this difficult tension by dist distancing the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New Testament. Uh, so the Old Testament conception of God was faulty or, at the very best, incomplete. Uh, the God of Deuteronomy must be trumped by the God of love whom we meet in the New Testament. Or, or others take a more sophisticated approach. Um, say, you know, when you read all the ancient Near Eastern materials, which you haven't read, but I know, uh, this was a typically exaggerated language they used for a religious war at the time. Deuteronomy and Joshua make it sound much worse than what really happened. The actual number of people who died were not thousands. These fights all happened at the fortified city or around the religious centers. No civilians died, but only fighting soldiers, and so on. You soften the difficulty as much as you can and hope that the problem will go away. Now, there is a certain persuasion in this line of reasoning, I must say, that there are some truth to it. It is right to acknowledge the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Not that God is different, but that there is a fullness of revelation in God's character, his will, and especially his purpose in the New Testament. We must factor that in, and we'll do so ourselves when we consider this passage in light of the coming of Jesus Christ a little later. And likewise, understanding the ancient Near Eastern context is a helpful reminder that the Bible is not an ahistorical book. These words were originally given to a people living in a particular time and space. Uh, we, need, we do need to be mindful of reading the modern genocides driven by racial discrimination and social Darwinism back into Deuteronomy chapter 7. Individual and corporate identity, church and state, were not as neatly separated as it is today. Having said that, however, the efforts to soften the blow, I don't think it works in the end. Yes, the New Testament tells us that God is love, but the same New Testament also tells us that God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. The intensity of God's love will consume and destroy those who persist in rebellion against him. Uh, not only that, God also kills people in the New Testament. Uh, sometimes for what we deem as not a very serious crime. 
Ananias and Sapphira for stealing and lying in Acts chapter 5. Herod for enjoying his parade a little too much in Acts chapter 12. As it turns out, God kills people throughout the Bible. From the floods in Genesis 6 to using the plagues in Egypt. And he even uses the cruel Babylonians to kill thousands of the Jews. Hannah understood and sang about this truth in 1 Samuel 2. The Lord kills. And the Lord brings to life. Job confessed this truth. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Now, if you seek to relieve the difficulty Deuteronomy chapter 7 presents by softening with all the qualification, some of that more true than others, but, but you'll soon find out that you'll need to write a whole new Bible. Now, I want to say the difficulty we feel when it comes to passages like Deuteronomy 7 at its core is about the question of authority. Does God have authority over human life? Does God have authority over your life? Does he give? Does he take away? Uh, Does God have authority over my life? Is life fundamentally a human right or a divine gift? Passages like Deuteronomy 7 confronts and reminds us that as the creator God has authority over every life, and every life is answerable to God. Both to the Israelites who first heard the command of Deuteronomy chapter 7, and to us today, Deuteronomy 7 forces us to answer. Is he God? Does God have a right to the knowledge of good and evil, or not? Are we answerable to him, or is he answerable to us? I think that's the first thing we must answer. But of course, the Bible doesn't stop there. The Bible also teaches us that the creator who has authority over all life is also the God of all goodness and righteousness. He always acts in justice and truth. That means if we find God's acts cruel and violent we must first question our own moral framework. You see, nowhere in the Bible does God endorse violence. Uh, instead, there are frequent condemnations of violence. Just quickly, you know, a few examples, Psalm 5, verse 5, and 11, 5, Proverbs 13, 2, Ezekiel 45, 9, and so on. Now, our problem is, the same God who hates violence throws down fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, brings devastating plagues in Egypt. You know, he killed every firstborn of of the Egyptians. God did it. He sends Israelites to conquer Canaan and destroy the Canaanites. How, How do we make sense of this seeming contradiction? Well, the answer is, Uh, The actions may look similar on the surface, but the ethic of an action is determined by the person who performs that action. Now, if that sounded like a pastor who spent too much time in his study without talking to anyone, I'll give you a more earthy example, right? Uh, A sniper on a battlefield is not a murderer, but a sniper in the CBD is. Or stabbing by a surgeon for an operation is not an assault, but stabbing by a robber is. If an evil man carries a club, we can be sure it is to crush and destroy. But if we saw Jesus carrying a rod, the Bible tells us that it is as a good shepherd to deliver the afflicted and bring justice to the wretched. I think Moses understood and believed this. That's why he was able to command the Israelites to do this. I think Israelites finally got it too. The question is, do we get it? Can we also believe in God's justice and goodness? Now, although God doesn't owe us explanation, in his kindness, he has given us some evidence of the righteousness of his actions here. Uh, let me make five observations very briefly. First, 
God was dealing with sinful nations here. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 4 says it. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 12. These people were not innocent. They were wicked to the point of offering child sacrifices. Uh, Second, God's judgment was not impulsive or rash. These nations had hundreds of years to repent before God. God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 that the sin of the Amorites is not yet. God was patient with them. They had 40 years to repent while Israelites were punished for their own sins in the wilderness. Yet they would not repent. Third, God shows no partiality or favoritism in his judgment. God warns Israel here that if they follow after other gods like the nations, they would suffer God's judgment in verse 4 and 5. So God's judgment was not based on ethnicity but ethics. On the flip side, God's salvation was not based on race, but grace. Fourth, God's command to put these seven nations to complete destruction was limited in its scope, both geographically and temporally. This is why Deuteronomy 7 cannot be applied directly by modern Christians today. Deuteronomy chapter 20 shows us that this was not to be Israel's general policy at all times. It was a a one-off event in the mold of Noah's flood to display God's power and justice and warn the whole watching world about God. In that sense, this was God's severe mercy. Finally, God always opens the door to those who would repent. Rahab and her household are saved and incorporated into the family of God, as we'll see in Joshua chapter 2. The whole tribe of Gibeonites in Joshua chapter 9, they were the Hivites, you know, found refuge through repentance. Psalmist was right to praise the Lord in Psalm 51 verse 17. God never despises a broken and contrite heart. See, God's judgment is always good and righteous, even when we cannot fully comprehend it. Now, I still find some elements of Deuteronomy 7 and book of Joshua difficult, but I can trust God that he does what is right. He knows the knowledge of good and evil better than I do. Now, I want to build on that last point about God's saving work in the midst of judgment under the next point, to complete holy calling. Uh, One explicit reason given for the complete destruction of evil and evildoers is in order for Israel to complete their saving calling by God. Now look at verse 6 again. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God had chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The reason why Israel must completely destroy evil and evildoers is because they are set apart for God, God of goodness, justice, and holiness. People who belong to this God must not compromise with the nations because God is one, Deuteronomy chapter 6. God will not tolerate idolatry. The language of Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 brings to mind what God had said earlier at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19 verse 4 to 6. God said of Israel, You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. In other words, Israel's calling was to be the mediator between God and the nations. Represent God to the nations, and bring nations to God. As the creator of all things, God's intention was always to bless all the families of the earth through the offspring of Abraham. God's election of Israel had the world in mind. After all, the whole world is God's. Every family belongs to God. And Israel was to be the vehicle of God's blessing and salvation to whole wide world. But this raises an interesting question, doesn't it, in Deuteronomy 7. Why then is the vehicle of God's blessing destroying? 
If Israel is God's instrument of salvation to the nations, what are they doing wiping out the nations? It seems completely com contradictory, almost similar to that contradictory action of God. There is a paradoxical tension here. Israel is chosen to be God's priest to the world, but in order for Israel to represent God to the world, the true God, not just a generic concept of God, or not even you know, spirituality, as we like to talk about it today, to represent Yahweh, the one God, they must judge idolaters. They must judge in order that salvation would flow out into the world. You can't have one without the other. As Hannah praised the Lord, the Lord kills and brings to life. The Lord brings resurrection, not instead of death, but through death. At this moment in salvation history, the destiny of the world depended upon the preservation of God's truth, the gospel entrusted to Israel. To preserve this gospel, those who reject God and hate God's people must be devoted to destruction. Lest Israel loses the gospel and with it, the hope of the whole wide world. Uh, do you see now why the measure is so severe in Deuteronomy? Nothing less than God's plan of salvation for the whole world was at stake here. But when we read the rest of the Old Testament story, we find out that Israel fails to fulfill this saving calling. They fail to be holy. They don't hold fast to the gospel according to Moses. They quickly compromise and go after other gods. Uh, by the time uh, that prophet Isaiah appears, uh, he has these words to say in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 4, Ah, sinful nation. Holy nation has become sinful. People laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers. You're not, you're not offspring of Abraham. You're offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken Yahweh. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. By the end of the Old Testament, Israel has become just like the nations and are driven out from God's land. And if the story ended there, there would have been no hope for the world. Our lot would have been with the Canaanites. There would have been no good news. But there came another Israelite, a true Israel, true son of Abraham. His name is Jesus Christ. Uh, when he came, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, just like the Israelites. But unlike Israel, Israelites, he did not test the Lord. He lived by every word that came from God. He committed no sin. He never compromised with evildoers, even though compromising would have meant saving of his own life. Rather, he loved God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with his, all his strength, all the days of his life. He fulfilled the greatest commandment. In Deuteronomy 6. And yet, uh, he, here is the twist, even greater paradox than what we see in Deuteronomy 7. Though he loved God without ever compromising, without ever sinning in thought, words, and deeds, th this is what happened to Jesus according to the Apostle Paul. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus fulfilled God's calling both to destroy evil and save sinners by the singular sacrifice of his life. Justice and mercy, that paradox we felt in Deuteronomy and all throughout Old Testament meets in this person. 
The dilemma we felt about God's justice and salvation meets at the cross of Christ. Jesus is the true Israel, true son of Abraham. He is God's vehicle, the ark, the temple, the only place God's blessing and salvation can be found. But if that is true, we must remember that outside of him, there is no blessing. There is no salvation. There is no refuge from the wrath to come. Now, in reading today's passage, if we find the death of the Canaanites difficult to process, did, did, did you experience that? If, if you read the passage before coming to church, and I did, uh, well, let's make sure also to ponder the horrific reality of Jesus' God-forsaken death upon that cursed cross. Uh, I wonder whether we find Jesus' death as difficult to comprehend. Do we read the New Testament and see Jesus dying on the cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And and find that difficult, uncomfortable. Or, or, Or do we sort of take his death for granted? After all, that's his job to die. Now, why did Jesus do this for us? Why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus take the punishment we deserve and and suffer that destruction of evil upon God's wrath? Why did he feel it upon himself and experience it going down all the way to hell? The answer is the same for us as it was for the Israelites in today's passage. Uh, Verse 7, it was not because you are more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples. Why did Jesus love you and gave himself up for you? Well, because he had set his love on you. In other words, he loved you because he loved you, isn't it? It's nothing to do with yourself. Nothing to do with what you've got to offer to God. But everything to do with his goodwill towards you. I find verse 7 very intriguing. Uh, Did you notice the order is, God set his love on you and chose you. I would have thought it would say, God chose you and set his love on you. But isn't it interesting? It's the other way around. We're used to the term sovereign grace, especially nowadays with that music ministry, you know, sovereign grace. Um, um, God uh, loves those whom he wills. That's true, but in Deuteronomy 7 here, I wonder whether gracious sovereignty captures the truth better. His sovereignty is exercised in grace. That's what he has done for you and I if you have come to know Jesus. God set his love on you and chose you. Uh, Verse 8 explains further why God loves us. Uh, Verse 8 It is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. He says, he loved us because he promised to love us. That's a circular argument, isn't it? Why did God promise to love us? Because he set his love on you. He loves you because he loves you. God is love. Now, brothers and sisters, I know we find God's judgment hard. Uh, God's judgment seems harsh at times. Uh, uh, We have questions, no doubt. Why doesn't God save everyone? Why does God send some people to hell? Uh, I'm not sure whether we can ever fully answer those questions. We're not God. The knowledge of good and evil belongs to God, the Creator, and Him alone. But here is an equally, if not more difficult question to answer. Why does God love me? Why has God chosen me? Why do I wake up this morning and find myself in the grip of his grace instead of his justice? That's a difficult question, isn't it? Do you ever ponder that? And whatever the answer to that question is, Moses says, whatever the answer is, 
it's nothing to do with you. Why does he love you? Nothing to do with you, everything to do with him. Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In it, we meet God who so loves us that he would face the destruction of his own body at the hands of his creatures. This gospel calls for a response of repentance and faith. Have you responded? This gospel is good news. It, it's great news. I don't know what, what other words we can use to describe this news. But the good news must be understood in the context of judgment. The horrific, horrifying reality we only glimpse in Deuteronomy chapter 7. The gospel is good. The gospel is great because the righteous judgment of God against our sin has been averted. That's why it's good news. But it is only good for those who would believe. For those who reject God, for those who respond to the Son of God's crucifying love towards them with the indifference, uh, the gospel sends this grievous warning. 2 Thessalonians 1.7 When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and away from the glory of his might. This is serious news. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and confess that you and you alone are the Lord of all creation, that you have authority to kill and to bring to life, that you give and you take away, and you always act in righteousness and goodness, even when we've not fully comprehended. Uh, Father, when we find it hard to see your goodness in this fallen world, lift our gaze to Christ Jesus to witness your justice. Thank you that in Christ Jesus you have set your love upon us and chosen us to yourself. That in him you promise to forgive our sins, welcome us into your family, and to destroy evil completely at Jesus' return, and that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Incline our hearts to love and serve Jesus Christ and him only. In whose name we pray. Amen.